a joy it is to be together to celebrate God's love and grace and to um, be together as we start our fall season. I'm glad to be back with you. I was gone to Canada to get my daughter into school and then we had to go take care of some family business in my wife's hometown and uh, in Canada so it's good to be back. It's good to be with you. Uh, several announcements. First of all, right after service, I hope you stay uh, because we're doing Rise Against Hunger, which is an incredible program. We're going to pack 20,000 meals to feed people. We all, um, our hearts and minds are on the people of Texas and the Caribbean, the people of Mexico and the people of Florida. Um, and as our hearts are there this day, um, we know that we can make a concrete difference. Uh, a couple ways. One, if you donate to United Methodist Comedian Relief Umcor, you write the check out to the church and write um, Hurricane in the Memo Line. 100% of your gifts and donations will go to, to relief. And the other way is to packing meals today uh, through Rise Against Hunger. After church, we'll have hamburgers and hot dogs and we'll have packed meals. Many of those meals will go to Houston, to Mexico. And to, and to Florida and to the Caribbean and all those places where meals are going to be needed. So uh, connect with that and you can really make a difference in people's lives. After service, I ask you to stay in the sanctuary for a few minutes. There's going to be a short video which will be a training to how we pack and so everyone can be well prepared to pack our meals. Uh, if you want to donate, there's an envelope. Uh, it was in your bulletins uh, for Rise Against Hunger and you can do that. Remember, $29 supplies a hundred meals. Uh, there are many opportunities in the bulk and I want to first of all say there's still a few meals that need to be made for St. Paul Soup Kitchen. It's a way we feed more locally. We're going there tomorrow so after the service if you will go and look and see how uh, you can be connected to that work and that ministry uh, and how you can help with St. Paul's that would be a blessing. Um, Thanks for everyone who participated in the yard sale yesterday, made over $600 for a Loyal Wish project. What a wonderful gift that was. And we appreciate everyone who was a part of it. There's other notes that are um, in the bulletin I want you to look at. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them. One is that, um, you know, I have the wrong bulletin here. I have July the 30th bulletin. These announcements are not the right announcements. Thank you. Oh, you have two. You got one for me. How thankful of you. One is that um, on September the 24th, there is a such thing as a free lunch. Uh, the youth group's going to host a lunch, so plan to stay for church, after church, because we'll be um, having a um, a lunch to celebrate the youth's work and the youth to say thank you for all that you do to provide them their ministry and thank you especially for the mission trips and what you've done to provide this mission trips. You'll get to hear their stories, talk to youth. You can come without making a reservation, but if you make a reservation, we will know how much food to prepare. And that would be a, a helpful, responsible way for us to be uh, with our resources. So we ask you to do that for us if you can. There's going to be a golf tournament on October 24th. There are flyers around the church. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to need you to sign up starting next week so that we know how many groups to prepare to tell the golf course. We'd love to have you play. You don't have to be any good. You can be a hack. I'm a hack. But we're going to have fun together. Uh, as a community, there will be some cookout. There will be some good fun connected to that. Coffee House on October the 15th. <clears throat> and pumpkins are being delivered the last day of September so we really are looking forward to that as well and the pumpkin patch will be open October the 1st and I encourage you to participate in that there are other announcements in the bulletin take a chance to look at I hope you take this bulletin home don't leave it here for recycle take it home and mark your calendars um, two more quick announcements one is that uh, the town is doing the Massachusetts Roadshow for Wilmington, Massachusetts, where everyone can bring three pictures and come and uh, have those pictures recorded in the archive, the history for our town. We made that announcement several weeks ago, and we had a sign-up sheet for that. 
Uh, I wanted to make clear that you can come even if you didn't sign up. That sign up was so that we could call and remind you. So we hope people will participate in that. The last announcement is going to be about scouts, but I'm going to give Bill a microphone before. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bill Clint. I am the scout leader for Troop 56. If you do not know this church, we help support two of the Boy Scout troops, and uh, troop and pack in the town. We have PAC 361. They meet here on Monday nights, and the church also supports Troop 56, who meets here on Tuesday nights. The boys do a lot, and it's an excellent program, and I don't see a lot of boys in the congregation at the moment, but if you have grandchildren, grandsons, nieces, I mean nephews, cousins, whoever, that are between the grades kindergarten through five, we would like to see them come Monday and Tuesday, tomorrow night and Tuesday night, they're having a sign up here at the church from six o'clock to eight o'clock. The, Scout, the Cub Scout program does everything from rocket launches to Pinewood Derby to camping to going to the Museum of Science. It's an excellent program. It's certainly better than the boys sitting at home doing nothing, watching TV or playing on their computers. If you have older boys from the sixth grade and up, they can come join us at Troop 56 downstairs on any Tuesday night, um, or they can contact uh, myself. Just go to scouting.org, do a quick search through Wilmington, you'll find out where to get a hold of any of the packs or troops locally. That's all, thank you. Wonderfully, and also the Girl Scouts after this service will be helping us with the packing of the meals and they will have some information about how our, our um, girls can get connected to that important organization as well. So there's lots of ways to connect uh, to the work of the community. We hope you find ways that connect you and your families. As we worship uh, this morning, we are mindful of the people of Florida and the storm that is raging there. We are praying for their safety as well as we keep in our hearts and minds the people of the Caribbean and, the, and Cuba and the places that the storm has already gone. Many of us have family and friends in Florida. Many of our church members are in Florida and we keep them in our hearts and prayers. We hope they're safe and we hope they're somewhere safe. And um, so let us... Um, Attune our hearts to God's grace and peace this day as we pray for them, as we continue to pray for the people of Mexico and Texas. Let us worship in truth and spirit. of God, live as children of the light. For once we were no people, and now we are God's people. Beloved of God, let your light shine. So that all may see God's grace and walk in the fullness of life. Our opening hymn is Shine Jesus Shine. It'll be on the monitors and it's 2173 in the small black hymnal.
may be seated. Please join me for the opening prayer. Gracious God, who lights our path and shows us the way to abundant life, give us the courage to let our light shine so that those who feel lost in the dark may know of your goodness. Allow our light to reflect your light and our love to reflect your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, now I know it's been a long summer, and a lot of us have been away, like me, and a lot of us have gone on trips and, and gone to places that are different than home. So I need, by a show of hands, who went away this summer somewhere? Okay, now if you went to a place and you stayed at someone's house, raise your hand. If you went to a place and you stayed in a hotel, raise your hand. And if you went camping, any campers in our midst? Anyone go camping? Ed, all right. All right. Well, what's the thing about camping? Is it easy to move around when you're outside camping at night? No, no. Sometimes, you need a little help, like a flashlight, right? Has anyone ever been somewhere and needed a flashlight and had it do this? It's not working. You ever have a flashlight not work when you need it? It seems every time I need one, it doesn't work. Now, we are kind of like this lantern, these flashlights, because like a lantern, we need stuff to help us work. And the lantern needs batteries. We, on the other hand, need God. So, unlike a lantern, we just can't take a part of ourselves out and replace it with something new. We have to go and find the thing that will give us the energy and the power to do what it is we need to do so we can be useful, so we can be loving, so we can be kind. And that thing that we have that fills us quite often would be, what do you think? The love of God? Can you shake your head? It's okay. Yeah. The love of God. And the power that we get from that, from that love that we, we share and we grow and we learn from our Bibles and we learn from each other, that power gives us the ability to shine. And when we shine, we allow other people to see the way to God, which is a pretty cool thing to do. So, knowing that, take in the power of Jesus, learn from the example of those around us, and let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love you've given us in our friends at church, in our families, and from the word you have spoken to us through Jesus. Help us to shine so people will know and be able to find you. In Jesus' wonderful name and in the power of your spirit, amen. amen. Now, if we could all as a community stand Share that love of Christ with your neighbor and greet one another in Christ's love.
please join me for the prayer of confession. Loving God, too often we have hidden our light rather than reflecting your goodness. We have been afraid to speak out for justice. We have been reluctant to tell others of your grace. We have hidden behind our good intentions without putting our convictions into action. Forgive us, O oh God, and restore us in your grace that our light may shine brightly for all to see. In the name of Christ, we pray, amen. The first scripture lesson today is from Psalms 119, and it's actually verses 33 to 40. It's found on page 578 of the Old Testament of your pew Bible, if you want to follow along, and on the monitor. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Con confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. And our second reading is from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. That's found on page 4 of the New Testament of your Pew Bible. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As most of you know, I am from the South, and that is a place where they take football seriously, especially college football. There's a story about a woman who went to see the Alabama-Auburn game one year. As you may or may not know, this is one of the great rivalries of college football. Both of these teams are in the state of Alabama, and to say that their fans don't get along is an understatement. Anyway, this woman joined 100,000 plus people who packed the stadium for the big game. A man sitting close to her noticed that the seat next to hers was empty. He scanned the stands, but that was the only empty seat he could find. Surprised to see any empty seat in this important game, even one, he asked the woman about it. Oh, she said, that seat belongs to my late husband, and I couldn't find anyone to come to the game with me. I'm sorry for your loss, said the man, but I'm surprised that a family member or a family friend didn't jump at the chance to see the big game. Me too, she replied, but they all decided to go to the funeral instead. <laughs> yes, football is big in the South. And it seems to be pretty important in New England, too, despite Thursday's results. Today, the beginning of our fall church schedule coincides with the opening weekend of the NFL season. As I considered this, I wondered what it would be like if, our, if we were as passionate about our faith as we are about our sports teams. I wondered what it would be like if people were as unabashedly proud of their faith as they are their NFL team. Have you ever heard anyone say, I'm a Patriots fan, but I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to seem too pushy? Have you ever seen anyone to say, it's okay to be a Patriots fan, but it's a private matter, keep it to yourself? 
Have you ever seen anyone refuse to talk about the Patriots because they didn't want to offend the Jets fan? It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Let me set the scene. Wesley was a popular preacher, so popular that he attracted crowds of hundreds in England during a period where less and less people were going to church. So someone asked him about his secret. What was it that allowed him to attract so many people? He replied, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. He was talking about the passion he had for his faith. A passion so deep, so all-consuming that his spirit was ablaze with it. And people were attracted to it like moths to a flame. They had to come and see what all the fuss was about. They had to see what was it that would make someone so passionate about their faith. It makes us a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? It's okay to admit Someone said that people should have a religion, just not too much of it. And we can kind of see their point. There's nothing more off-putting than someone who goes on and on and on and on about their religion. They seem to always be shoving God down your throat. What was it that was different about John Wesley? Why were people attracted to him in his burning faith instead of repelled by it? Well, to use the phrase of my southern upbringing, Wesley didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. He wasn't just passionate about his faith, his faith was compassionate. He got up early in the morning to feed the hungry. He and his band of Methodists spent time caring for the poor, serving the downtrodden, and standing with the oppressed. He spoke out against slavery. He railed against the poorhouses. He worked to alleviate the social injustice of his society. That has always been the hallmark of Methodism. We've always been a people of the social gospel. That is, a people of action who embody God's love and grace in real, tangible ways with the most needy in society. We have always been a people who stood for justice. That was true for Wesley and the early Methodists, and it is true today. It is one of the ways that we let our light shine so that others can see. Did you catch that? I said one of the ways. What attracted so many people to the faith of John Wesley was that he preached a balance between social holiness and personal holiness. Now holiness isn't a popular word today. It has all kind of negative connotations. It would be just as accurate and more understandable to the modern ear to substitute the word spirituality for holiness. Wesley said that the way we make our light shine in a way that is so warm and authentic that it attracts people to our passionate faith is to combine a genuine, compassionate, social spirituality that seeks to live out the gospel of Jesus with a personal spirituality that seeks to grow deeper in our relationship with God through worship, prayer, and study. Our social spirituality makes our faith real in the world and our personal spirituality grounds us and our social action in Christ, giving our faith and authenticity, increasing our empathy and compassion. Our personal spirituality is the why behind the action of our social spirituality. If we have one without the other, then eventually our faith becomes shallow and unattractive. Without personal spirituality, our social spirituality becomes self-serving and condescending. And without social spirituality, 
our personal spirituality becomes hollow and empty. If our light is to shine with passion to attract others to God's grace, then we need both. What about our church? What about each of us personally? Does that church light shine so brightly to attract others to God's grace and love? Are we a congregation of both social and personal spirituality? What about each of us? We can't judge others, but can we each can reflect our own faith journey. How bright is our light shining? Do we have a passionate spirituality? Are people attracted to God through our witness and example? Do we both exhibit social and personal spirituality? In the psalm that we read this morning, the psalmist writes, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it in my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. These words are the grounding of a personal spirituality that leads to an authentic social spirituality. Our faith is grounded in our study of Scripture. When we commit ourselves to studying and reading the Bible, it transforms us. Yet, though we know how important the Bible is, it doesn't always actually translate into studying it. Did you know that the Bible is the best-selling book in the world? It is, more, it is in more households in the U.S. than any other book. Yet survey after survey tells us that people aren't reading it. There's an old saying that says, one Bible that is read is better than two on a shelf. Yet many people never take their Bibles off the shelf. Why? Sometimes we may feel that we already know enough about the Bible. After all, we've been to Sunday school when we were kids. We come to worship every Sunday. We hear the scripture proclaimed. We hear sermons reflecting on it. We know some important passages of the Bible. We, we know that one about life. We know that the, peace, the meek shall inherit the earth. We, we have a sense that we can tell the Good Samaritan story. Uh, we, we know the Bible song. So why go to study? As many of you know, my wife, Sandra, is also a pastor. And she used to serve as a pastor of First United Methodist Church in Framingham. And while she was there, there was a little girl who came to church every Sunday. She was in second grade at the time. And she love attending Sunday school. Her family had been to the church for two years and every week she'd go to Sunday school and she was so excited. She always talked about what she had learned and she loved making the crafts. Then that August, the Sunday school superintendent came and saw the little girl and said, guess what? Sunday school starts back in two weeks. Expecting the girl to get all excited as she usually did. But the girl said, I don't think I'm going to go to Sunday school this year. Surprised, the superintendent said, why not? And she said, well, I've been going for two years now, and I think I've learned it all by now. <laughs> we laugh. But sometimes we feel the same way, don't we? Yet, the Bible is a living book. That means that we bring our whole selves to it. Our experiences, our feelings, our insight into life, our needs. We bring to it our life situations, our fears, and our hopes. And as we do this, the Bible speaks to those things. It speaks to who we are and the experience that we have in this moment and our current need. That is why we can read the Bible 
and a passage that has never made sense before suddenly does now? It's because of what we're going through. Or we can read a passage that we've read several times and find something new in it. The passage hasn't changed, but we have. Our needs have. And the Bible is speaking to us in a new way. We never outgrow our need to study Scripture. Other times we may shy away from studying the Bible because we don't feel that we know enough about the Bible to actually be in Bible study. The Bible can be scary to read. It was written in a different time, in a different culture. It was written in a different language, and there are just so many English translations. Which one to choose? So what do we do? Is there any hope in understanding it? So we choose not to study it at all, thinking we just don't know enough to start. Or thinking that everybody else in Bible study is going to know a whole lot more than we do and we'll be embarrassed. Yet, yeah, and some of you have heard this illustration because it's my favorite. Would we allow our children or grandchildren to skip math class because they didn't know enough math? Or would we encourage them telling them that the only way they're going to learn math is by going to math class, by practicing their math problems, by studying their math. The same is true for the Bible. The way we learn it is to jump in. And I promise you, the Bible is so rich, so deep, that all of us have something to learn and can learn. And none of us are experts and we all come with our own questions and there's room and space for everybody and we don't laugh at each other but we learn from each other there are many opportunities to join us in Bible study over the course of these next nine months there's going to be a lot of short term studies there's going to be a study later on about introduction to the Bible there's going to be a study on Methodism there's going to be a once a month seminar that you don't have to prep for, that you come to. And we're going to discuss different topics. One month, we're going to ask, why are there no dinosaurs in the Bible? <coughs> then one Sunday, we're going to explore the book of Revelation. And it's scary, and how can we get a handle on it? And one week, we're going to explore the hymns and praise songs that we love, and how they shape our faith, and how they're grounded in Scripture. There is going to be a short-term study later on for people who want to read a book that is really deep and really makes us think hard. And we're going to walk through it together realizing that it's going to be tough at some points. But if you want to take something that really challenges you, that's a place you can go. Even if you don't haven't read much of the Bible, it will help you shape your thinking around your faith. And there's going to be classes that are introduction classes. There's a class every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning. You can go to either one that thinks about the passages that we preach on a Sunday morning or books of the Bible that we look at and gives us a chance to uh, make worship preparation a week-long event to deepen our time. There are many ways that we can be in Bible study and it will help us grow in our personal spirituality and will deepen our relationship with God as we discover the transforming and guiding power of Scripture in our lives. So I encourage you to get involved this year. Find a study, just a start, and see where it leads you. The story is told that during Vince Lombardi's years at Green Bay, the Packers were one Sunday was resoundingly defeated by an opposing team. Unfortunately, we in New England know what that's like this last week. And that week it seemed like the Packers did everything wrong. The next day in practice, Coach Lombardi stood up and said, Gentlemen, I have seen enough. We're going to start over right here at the very beginning. The object I'm holding in my hands is called a football. 
And one of the players jokingly said, Coach, please don't go so fast. Sometimes it's like that for us. We need to step back and to look at our faith and take it from the beginning in order to continue to grow. We need to get back to the roots of our faith and those roots are found within the pages of scripture and in them we discover the transformative power of God in our lives that helps our light shine for God. As you may have guessed, the theme for our program year is let your light shine. And over the next nine months, we will explore ways to deepen the passion we have for our faith and the passion of our faith, growing both in our social and personal spirituality so that our light shines for all to see and that we grow in faith and grow as a church and grow as sharing God's love of the world in a way that makes people want to come and experience what we experience and know what we know and feel what we feel. Where we can set ourselves on fire and be an attractive presence for God's love and grace that grows disciples and builds our church. So brothers and sisters, we participate in that this day in several ways. We have gathered for worship, we sing and we praise and we allow that spirit to kindle in us. Today after the service we go down have a hot dog or a hamburger or both and then go and pack meals to feed others. We sign up for St. Paul's Soup Kitchen today so we can feed people locally. And we know that in the regions that have been devastated by earthquake and hurricane, in the regions that have been devastated by drought and lack of rain or war or people who are fleeing as refugees and camps that are overcrowded wondering when they'll get home we'll have a meal that we packed and though they will never hear the word Wilmington, Massachusetts, or Bill Ricca, or Burlington, or Woburn. They may never hear of Tewksbury, but they will know that there's someone out there who cares enough to pay for some food, to package the food, and to send it to them. And that not only feeds the body, that feeds the soul. And that lets our light shine. So brothers and sisters, let your light shine so that all may know of the love of God. Amen. I'm going to invite you to rise as you're able. And we're going to sing together the hymn, I'm going to live so God can use me. Number four, wait. And we're going to do something in this service, and that is, we're going to clap. So please rise as you're able, and I don't care if we choose one and three or two and four. We're going to, let's all choose the same one, by the way. Let's rise together and let's sing and let's clap. I need your help with clap because I don't have rhythm, so I need to follow you.
Amen. You may be seated. O Christ, who stilled the waves and calms the heart, this morning as we worship, we are mindful of all the churches that are closed, the churches in Texas that are flooded, the churches in Florida which are being battered by storms, the churches of the Caribbean that are damaged by hurricane, and the churches of Mexico which are digging out from an earthquake. Yet, O oh God, we are mindful of more than just brick and mortar. Remember the people of these places and pray for their safety. Give all who are on our southeast coast, from Florida to Georgia to Alabama to South Carolina, your peace. Give them your strength your grace and love, your hope and courage. Today also we remember that tomorrow marks the anniversary of the terrible terrorist attacks that continue to affect our nation. As we mark its anniversary, move the hearts of people that no such tragedy ever happen again. Make tomorrow a solemn day of remembrance where people pull together in peace, dedicating themselves to creating a world where all people are respected and valued as your children. Create bridges of understanding between people and eradicate hate from our world that such horror will be unknown in our future. We pray for our communities and our people you have heard all the prayers that we have raised this day and all the needs that weigh heavy on our spirits. You know the prayers of our hearts that go unspoken and the needs that are so deep we can't even find words. Yet, O oh God, you speak to us in sighs that are too deep for words. And we give to you our joy the celebration of community and worship. Those who are our guests this day who come to worship with us and celebrate your love and enrich us by their presence. We ask for your blessings to be abundant, that we may abundantly share them so that all know your goodness as we allow our light to shine and reflect your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, as we share his prayer, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Rise the kingdom, the power, and the glory for you. Amen.
Let us receive our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Pray together. O oh God, who teaches us by this act of worship that it is more blessed to give than to receive, graciously accept these our offerings and give us the right spirit both in giving and receiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able. Our hymn is Here I Am, Lord.
As we get ready to leave this morning, a couple of things. First of all, coffee hour is not in the coffee room, but it's downstairs where there's some snacks and there's some hamburgers and some hot dogs. Even if you can't stay to, to pack food, we invite you to um, come down and have a snack before you go off to your other responsibilities of the day. If you are a guest here and you weren't prepared to pack food, you're welcome to stay. If your life has taken you elsewhere, we still invite you to come and have something. Even if it's not a hamburger, you're welcome to a hamburger. But if you just want a light cookie and to visit a few people, we would love that. I ask that you look around and you see the guests that are with you and you invite them down and show them where to go. We're going to be in the courtyard. But before you do that, I ask you to remain in the sanctuary for a few minutes for a short video. Last service, it didn't have sound, but I'm trusting that the power of God and the wisdom of Bill Clint will make it work. <laughs> our benediction today is going to be this little light of mine, verse 1. We're going to do our benediction together. I invite you to sing our benediction and go in God's peace and grace and let your light shine.